Hello, my name is Jack Klieger. I'm the president and CEO of the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. I want to welcome you to the 22nd annual Fania Gottesfeld Heller Conference uh, for Educators. Um, I speak for the museum's board of trustees, its staff, its volunteers, and its community of Holocaust survivors as we remember our friend Fania Gottesfeld Heller of blessed memory. Fania was a survivor, a philanthropist, and an author who went through the pain of recounting her own experiences in order to teach others. This is an incredible gift to every student and every educator that she encountered. We all learned from Fania's spirited dedication to Holocaust education and Jewish learning. I would like to highlight Mrs. Heller's memoir for children, Hidden, a true story of the Holocaust. Mrs. Heller documented her remarkable story so that people of all ages could learn from it. The museum has been honored to offer the annual Fania Gottesfeld Heller Conference for educators since 1999. Every year, this conference brings together world-renowned scholars to address groundbreaking issues in Holocaust studies. We are so pleased to be able to offer this conference in her memory today. We miss Fania Gottesfeld Heller dearly and we are honored to remember her with her family, some of whom are among the audience today. We hope that it is some comfort to them to be among so many teachers whose lives Fania Heller touched, and to know that through these teachers, her story will reach thousands of students. At this time, I'd like to invite Elizabeth Edelstein, VP for Education, to begin the program. Elizabeth. Thank you, Jack. It's my pleasure now to introduce our speaker, Alexandra Zapruder. Ms. Zapruder began her career as a member of the founding staff of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, where she served on the curatorial team for that museum's exhibition for young visitors, Remember the Children, Daniel's Story. Many of you in today's audience will know Ms. Pruder as the author of the groundbreaking book, Salvaged Pages, Young Writers Diaries of the Holocaust, which was published by Yale University Press in 2002 and which won the National Jewish Book Award in the Holocaust category. She wrote and co-produced I'm Still Here, a documentary for young audiences based on her book, which was nominated for two Emmy Awards. Ms. Zapruder has been published in Parade, Lit Hub, Smithsonian, and the New York Times. In addition to her many other accomplishments, Ms. Zapruder sits on the board of directors for the Educators Institute for Human Rights, and in 2020, in partnership with them, launched a project called Dispatches from Quarantine, which provided a platform for young people to document their real-time experiences of life during the COVID-19 pandemic. She will present on this project today. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Alexandra Zapruder. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Liz. It's great to see you again. Uh, thanks for having me again and to the Hellers um, for having me back at this wonderful, conference. Uh, the last time I was there, we were in person uh, with Michael Berenbaum and the late Ellie Wiesel. So it's, a, and the first time that I was there, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was the first time that I presented on um, Salvage Pages, the very, very, very beginning of the history of that book. So it's wonderful to be here again. Um, and thanks for having me. So I thought I would um, begin by going back a little bit to talk about the origins of this project, Dispatches from Quarantine, and give you a sense of how this I arrived at this work and then how I put this project together and what we learned from it, and really with the focus on um, educators and what educators can draw from the work that we, from, from what we learned from Dispatches from Quarantine. In some ways, I like to think that this project and everything that I do now in my career really began um, way back in 1991 when I was on the founding staff of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and I encountered the diary of Yitzhak Rudashevsky who wrote in Vilna Ghetto and this was a diary that I did not know anything about. It was the one of the very first ones that I read and it was extraordinary because 
this young man who was 15 years old at the time really had a kind of visionary idea for his writing. He wasn't just writing a personal diary only about his internal life, but he was really documenting daily life in the Vilna ghetto and what was happening not only to himself and his family, but to the wider community. And it sort of brought about a shift in my thinking about young people and how a young person's diary can make a contribution to the historical record um, and sort of shifted a little bit the framing, for example, of Anne Frank's diary, which has always been looked at as a very personal record, very much about her internal life and kind of what can we learn about Anne Frank from reading Anne Frank's diary, although there is, in fact, a lot of historical information in the diary itself. But Itzhak Rudyshevsky's diary is really about the world that he was living in and his effort to have a creative and intellectual life during the Holocaust. So with that shift, the next 10 years of work on what ultimately became Salvaged Pages was really framed by this idea that young people can and do make a contribution to the public record in even in personal writing. And some of these young people who were writing diaries and journals were doing so in a very intentionally public way. They were like Rudyshevsky, really intending to record what was happening in their lives in order to um, preserve those records and hopefully have them be found and read after the war. But even young people who were writing very personal accounts still left behind a record that has meaning for us now. If we read it in the context of other writings, if we read it in the context of the full historical record, there's often a lot of insight, there's nuance, there's complexity about the lived lives of young people that can be drawn from those accounts. And so the reason I'm emphasizing this framing is because although the diaries that became salvaged pages reveal an enormous amount about daily life in the Holocaust, the bigger story for me was about how young people can make a contribution, how it's not just adults who keep journals or diaries and who leave records behind that influence the way we understand the historical past, but that it's also possible for young people to do this. In the years since Salvage Pages came out, that idea has gotten born out by finding and encountering many, many, many more diaries written by young people, non-Jewish teens who wrote during World War II, but also young people who wrote diaries and whose diaries were published um, from more contemporary wars and genocides. And sort of this idea of beginning to kind of explore this idea of what kinds of surviving contemporaneous records exist um, kept by young people. In 2019, I was very fortunate to um, be at the opening of an exhibition that I curated at Holocaust Museum Houston on this very subject, on writings, diaries of teens in war and genocide. So in this exhibition, not only were there Jewish teenagers who wrote during the Holocaust, but we also had diaries and journals kept by young people in the Bosnian War. There was a diary kept by a girl who lived through the war in Iraq. There was a boy who wrote a diary in Japanese American internment. There was another young man who wrote during um, living under ISIS. So again, this ongoing kind of broadening sense of young people as documentarians of their own time and, and trying to make connections across the time periods too, looking at these diaries, reading them and thinking, you know, are there themes that kind of run through these contemporary writings that also occur? in the writings of World War II and even, even before that time. But the real sort of thing that happened that was so um, jarring to me or the thing that kind of jolted me into thinking about present day writing of teens was that while we were getting ready for the opening of the exhibition in Houston, it was right at the time that family separation was happening during the Trump administration. And I knew that there were um, detention centers very near where I was doing this work in Houston, uh, where young people, teens and kids were being separated from their parents and being held in, in these detention centers, it recently arrived immigrants to this country. And I found myself thinking, you know, what would these young people write about their lives if they had journals and diaries? Or do they have journals and diaries? Are there young people inside these places who are documenting in real time 
this event that we are all watching from the outside. And I really, I knew that there wasn't really too much that I could do in that particular moment to pursue that question, but it made, started to make me think about all the pockets of American society in which there might be young people who are living lives that, that we as adults perhaps don't understand or, or enduring um, aspects of the American experience that we simply don't have access to because they're not writing and they're not publishing and they're not, um, they're not creating these kinds of records that we can read on a daily basis. So when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, it became very quickly, very clear that we were living through a collective moment, something that we were all sharing, even though many of us were living it and experiencing it in different ways. And it felt like a moment to try to see if it was possible to create some kind of opportunity for young people to document their experiences in real time. But, you know, a lot of people were calling for for young people to write diaries and journals. And a lot of people were calling for adults to do it. This wasn't something that was unique to me. But what I felt was very particular about my own perspective on this was to think about what it would mean for a young person to undertake the act of, of writing about their lives or documenting, reflecting in some way about their lives in the COVID-19 pandemic with an understanding of the historical context of young people having kept diaries for hundreds of years before this time? And was there a way to make a link between the historical material that exists and young people writing today? So not just to say, keep a journal, but to say, here's someone who did this in this particular period about this particular thing, and can this inspire you? Is there some way to turn this into a prompt that can make you want to reflect and think about your life and then document it, um, either anonymously or in an attributed form, um, either for yourself privately or for the public. And so I got a small team of people together and we built a website. It was, I will say, something of a proof of concept, really. You know, I knew that we didn't have a lot of time to kind of really think it through. We just wanted to do something, take the opportunity quick and dirty and throw this thing up there and see, would young people be interested? Would they have things to say that would be interesting and insightful? And once we collected some material, would we find threads or themes that would be valuable and interesting? And so that's what we did. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen now because I'll, I wanna show you the site. Um, and give you a sense of how, how this worked, how um, the, the prompts and the, the weekly prompts work. So first on the page, the home page, um, the text has now changed, but it was simply a description of our project. And the tagline was, young people have always found a way to be heard. So again, making this connection with the historical past, and hopefully inspiring young people to write today and making sure that in this context, it was clear that this is a continuum, that we're asking young people to share their thoughts against the backdrop of many, many, many young writers who kept diaries on their own over many decades, dozens and dozens of years. So the way that we created the prompts was the I will say that the actual logistics of getting the diary entries or getting the journal entries uploaded was a little clunky. Um, this is something that I would certainly do differently, but we just had a way that we had a, a kind of consent pathway that we created to make sure that um, young people 13 and over were consenting to give us access to their thoughts and that they understood that these would be private unless we were allowed to make them public, but that if there was anything in them that was unsafe, we would have the right to contact someone on their behalf. And then anyone who was 12 and under uh, had to have a parent submit uh, for them. And so we began with the very simplest thing. I chose an entry written by an anonymous boy um, in Lodge Ghetto, which some of you may know, um, who begins 
his diary by writing, I decided to write a diary, although it is a bit too late. To recapitulate the past events is quite impossible, so I begin with the present. And the idea here is not to make a direct link between the Holocaust and the pandemic, or what people, what he might have written and what somebody would write today, but simply with the idea of beginning. How do you begin? And what is the what are the challenges of beginning? And if you were going to begin with the present, whatever that present is for you, how would you do it? And so then we provided some prompts. Begin with the present. Where are you? How long have you been in quarantine? What happened today? What are your main concerns right now? So again, this idea that you know, not everyone knows how to keep a diary and not everybody is comfortable with this kind of writing. And so giving some prompts or hints or clues to get people started seemed like a really important thing to do. And then we wanted to make these historical connections. So we wanted to say, who was this writer who wrote this diary? Where can it be found? Um, you know, what is this? So that all the time young people are thinking, as they begin their their diary entry and they share their thoughts, they're thinking, I'm not the first person to ever do this. There is a continuum that I am, am um, operating on. So we had um, six weeks to do this before school, school, online school ended. So the next one that we did was about what do you miss? And this one was written by an Iraqi girl who was writing in the in the war in Iraq. And she was describing what she missed since the change in her life, since the war had come to her city in Mosul. And so then again, here are the prompts. We sort of drew from what was in the excerpt and translated it to a set of prompts that would be thematically connected to the diary, but that would allow students to write or young people to write about their present day experiences. So I'm just gonna quickly skim through, all of this is available on my website. It's very easy to find. So I'm just gonna quickly show a couple more. Um, it seemed really important in this particular context to do something on art um, because even though I have a strong interest in writing and I think journal writing is a particularly interesting and valuable kind of um, method, some people are not writers and you know we don't want to exclude someone from sharing something because that's not their medium and so we what we made it very clear in the directions that we included that we would take any kind of contribution we would take art we would take um, written accounts we would take audio journals or video journals which we didn't get any of but i would have been happy to have um, we would take songs, we pretty much there wasn't really anything as long as it was about the pandemic and it was contemporaneous, that it was being made as a response to this event in real time, we were open to it. So it was important to, to make that explicit. And so we did this prompt um, by using a drawing from the diary of Stanley Hayami, who wrote in a Japanese American internment camp um, about um home and about or sorry about where where are you physically and so our prompts were inviting young people either to draw or to say in words where they are physically and where they were physically in their space and this seemed really important in the context of quarantine where all of us were suddenly in our houses all the time and our houses started to feel different and there were different things that we noticed and we were with our families all the time and we were in rooms that we were used to kind of passing through or barely spending any time in. And then suddenly, you know, you were in this room 14 hours a day. And so we really wanted young people to, to think about that and to make those kinds of connections. Um, what are you doing with your time? Was another one inspired by the wonderful diary of Yitzhak Rudashevsky. That was the fourth one. The fifth one was alone and together. So this one was about people and about the, and about the collective nature of this experience. So Alice Ehrman writing in Terezine wrote this beautiful entry about um, people carry their heroism masked behind an everyday face. They no longer even talk about it. 
Every loved one is alone with their waiting, cares, fears. What should one call it? The city is so exhausted. We will bear all this, I and the city and you and you. And to me, when I read that, I thought this could be today. You know, this you could you could reinterpret those words in the context of what we were living with. So again, we offered these prompts and asking young people to think about um, not only what they were experiencing individually, but also the news of the pandemic in their community and in America and, and how they understood their own experience and the collective experience of the world going through this life changing um, experience. And then finally, the very last one actually um, was kind of a surprise. It sort of came about because of the George Floyd um, murder. And that was kind of dominating the news that week. And so we took the opportunity to ask young people to think about the protests and the violence and the on the street and what they were seeing or hearing or thinking about um, sort of not related specifically to COVID-19, but to another collective experience that, that young people were, or that, that the whole world or whole, all of America was going through. And so again, here are the prompts for that. So um, what I'd like to do is just take a minute and show you now some of the responses that we got. So we, we learned a lot from this and we got about 300 entries. Um, one of the things that we learned was that young people didn't write um, serially. So they didn't like come back and write every six, every week for six weeks which is sort of what we hoped. Very often they were assigned this in class or they were um, given it as a homework assignment. And so they did one entry and then that was it. So that was something that I really wanted to think about in future iterations of this project. How is it possible to get young people to contribute or to create something that is more like an ongoing journal that might have its own individual arc through time as well as connections across writers. Um, there were some of them that were certainly felt kind of formulaic, but we got a surprising amount of contributions, surprising number of contributions that were very insightful and that echoed one another and echoed other things that we um, had read in other places and times. So I'm going to just take a minute and read a couple of these aloud and talk about them. The first one if I can just find it, is um, Isabel Boyer. And I really suggest, if you have time at some point, to come back and, and read some more of these because they're really wonderful. And I think for you as teachers, they can be very useful, both in helping your students think about and process the pandemic and what they experienced in the pandemic, but also the experience of writing about their own lives. So. This one begins, this is May of 2020, May 5th, eight weeks into quarantine. Dear diary, panic, panic on the news, panic from the schools, panic from my parents, panic from the people, drowning in panic. For what? I had no time to process the situation. Quarantine had become faster than I could wrap my head around anything, leaving me with unanswered questions, leaving me in shock. The virus sped, spread faster than ever before. There's a virus and it's deadly. I am declaring this a national emergency due to these unprecedented times. Stay inside, stock up now, six feet apart, no mask, no entry. The nation as a whole is in quarantine. They just announced a stay at home order. The scariest part is watching with my very own eyes as our kind turns on one another. I currently live in a society where greed overpowers helping hands, where panic overpowers positivity. I see people creating mountainous stockpiles compared to what they need, leaving others with nothing, shelves empty. I hear news reports of people breaking social distancing, endangering the lives of people. For what? To have fun? It's embarrassing. 
Embarrassing to think that people can't do the bare minimum and stay home. It's common courtesy. Risking the lives of others because it doesn't affect us? Oh, but it does. Grandparents, loved ones, people with tales to tell, people with lessons to teach, legacies to pass on. I don't understand why it's so hard to just change perspectives and viewpoints just for a second. I'm 15 and it's not that hard. So I love this entry because there's so many ways in which there are little expressions and little moments that were totally not a part of our lives before the pandemic, but that she has preserved here. Six feet apart, you know, six feet now means something to all of us, this social distancing that it didn't mean before the pandemic, no mask, no entry, you know, the idea of, um, a, you know, quarantine or, or staying at home, the stay at home order, you know, this terminology, this language that we're now so accustomed to, but that was so new and jarring and strange for us at the time. And then of course, you know, here is this 15 year old girl who from her own perspective is watching what she's seeing and she is seeing something that makes her feel um, very sort of um, very unsure about her society or very kind of sad about people and about what they're doing and the way in which they are functioning. And of course, not everyone viewed the same, viewed the same, viewed things the same way, but this particular account really, I think, voices what many of us felt about this question of greed and people failing to attend to other people in the way that we would want them to in a collective emergency. I'm going to go back. And okay, I want to read another one, this one, and then I'm going to show you some of the artwork as well. Um, this one is by Erin Shim. Um, and I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's quite long, but I'm just going to read the, a little bit of the second and third paragraphs. She says, she writes, as an Asian American teenage girl in quarantine, a little over six months left until early decision deadlines, college has become my personality trait. By habit, I glance up at my ticking clock, if you can even call it a clock. It's more of a flashing number on the top right corner of my laptop. It flashes 55607 as I typed this. I'm not quite sure if I should say type or typed as it was 55607, but now it is 55739 and time continues to flee. It is an interesting concept this time, a concept made just the more mischievous by quarantine. Not only is time the one thing the quarantined world seems to be unable to measure, my mother and I hold random bets on who can guess the date, neither of us is ever correct, but the only thing we care about, this virus feels more like a when than a what. I love that line. This virus feels more like a when than a what. And then jumping down, she writes, I talked to my friends today. We made jokes about how quarantine feels like being on an airplane. We're watching movies we've already seen at 2 p.m. while eating pretzels and our heads hurt. Someone makes a Chinese joke. My best friend asks if my mom is cooking a bat for dinner. Ha ha, didn't laugh. It's just a joke, but it is from China. But Erin, you're not Chinese. I believe that everyone is more than entitled to their own opinions and values. But as purely ignorant opinions are fueled by those in power, common courtesy and societal consciousness seem to have left the chat. So that was really interesting to us to have an entry like that one that gave a perspective on, you know, from someone who was Asian American and who was experiencing this, um, not necessarily Asian hate, but certainly ignorance um, around the origins of the, the pandemic. So I have two other entries that I'd like to read, but I'm, I wanna show you a couple of the works of art that, that came in. This one was written by, this one was created by a, a old, slightly older girl. I think she was 20, called Zoe Sevier. I hope you can see it. Kind of a collage 
um, really wonderful, I think, with the coffee and the moon and the shower, the cigarette, um, you know, the cat, half of her face, and then half of the cat's face. Um, so just kind of a little montage kind of, of, of what her life was like in quarantine. This one, Sophia Layton. Let's see if I can make it a little smaller so you can see the whole thing. Right here. No. So you can see again, this just, you know, this is just her, her representation, her face and in, in her hands and or someone's face in their hands and then butterflies, a bird, flowers, sun, and you'll be okay. And then I want to show you, oh yeah, this one, which I love. Um, so this one was a girl called Stephanie who did an assignment. It was actually an assignment for school, but I love this combination of writing and these little sketches. So since the COVID-19 thing happened, our lives changed a lot. And then we have this little drawing. We started to have classes online. We started to wear masks and we keep social distance from each other. I have to say that I actually like the schedule right now. Sleep till 10 in the morning, have only four classes a day, lots of time to walk outside. But at the same time, I understand the whole thing is not a joke. People are dying globally. So again, it's not so much that anything, any of these particular reflections are earth shattering. But this is just a snapshot of a way that one young person chose to document this moment in these little sketches, these little drawings, and um, her, her short writings. So I'm going to read from two more. And then I'm going to say a couple words about kind of what followed from this. Um, and then I would love to, and sort of where we went from this version of Dispatches from Quarantine and where we're going with it now. Um, so let me find, uh, let's see, oh, this one. Sorry, give me one second to find it. I know that they don't move around, but it feels sometimes like they move around. Um, I think I passed it. So, oh, here it is. Sorry about that. Okay. By Angelina Gao. So this one, I'm going to read the whole thing. And I love this entry because this is something that, um, you know, one of the things that happened when I was doing the work on salvaged pages and when I was collecting the diaries that I did for um, the exhibition in Houston, you know, when you, when you cast a very wide net and you collect a lot of material, you always get certain things that you expect to find, right? We expect it in these young writers' accounts that we would hear about fear, about boredom, about online schooling, about tension with family, about being afraid to go outside. I mean, there's certain things that are attributes or sort of common aspects of the experience that we were all living through that we expected. But one of the things that is great when you do a project like this is that you get a lot of things that you don't expect. And sometimes you start to see something recur. And this entry is a wonderful example of something that came up um, throughout the body of material. I'm going to read it and then I'll say a little bit about it. April 21st, 2020. So this is again, almost just a month or so after we all went into quarantine. And this was an answer to uh, where are you right now? This was a, a what an answer to that prompt. My desk faces a window. The windowsill is dusty, so are the blinds and the window panes, and there isn't much of a view. When I look out, I am greeted by a tall palm tree. The tips of its fronds are turning yellow. I hope it is not diseased. Behind the palm tree is our neighbor's house. Below it is a fence crawling with honeysuckle. Before it all, I rarely looked out this window. What's on the desk in front of me was more important. Textbooks, homework, the essay I type away at as my eyes fix blankly at a computer screen. The view outside was a distraction from my work. So the blinds were angled in a way that they blocked most of the sunlight and all of the sky. 
A part of me is grateful for this pandemic. For the first time in many months, I open my window all the way and pull up the blinds. I am met with bird song. They visit nearly every day. A pair of house finches, perhaps a morning dove, a flash of iridescent green that announces the arrival of a hummingbird that flits among the honeysuckle tendrils. My neighbor's plump black and white cat drops by too. He too watches the birds as he perches demurely on our shared fence, taking in the sun. I take pictures of them through my dusty window panes with the fascination of a new parent crooning over their infant, eagerly sharing the two zoomed in blurry photographs with everyone around me who cared to see. Many curse this pandemic, cry over the state of the economy, lament the supposed restriction of their First Amendment rights. While they do so, I put aside my school books for a few hours and sit in the sunlight at my desk. I pull open the blinds and watch the birds outside. This is something that we saw in a great many entries was just, and I think as teachers, you will so relate to this, even though for many of us as adults, our lives got much, much, much harder in the pandemic because for us, we were doing our jobs as well as having our kids at home. But for some of our teens, I think for quite a number of teens, there was something of a reprieve in this time that they slowed down for the first time in a long time, especially high school kids who have been driven so hard, they work so hard, they have to constantly be thinking about their sports and their extracurriculars and their tests and getting ready for college. And, you know, how are they going to present themselves to, you know, in their applications? And here's this writer. And we, again, we saw it again and again and again, saying, I finally have a minute to just look outside and listen to the birds or other writers. So many writers said, I finally get a chance to spend some time with my family, you know, and I, and, and, or I finally get a chance to just relax and, and slow down and feel a release of the pressure. And I think that although we always have to be remembering the bigger context, of course, that people were dying and that people were suffering and getting sick, and it's not something to be taken lightly, there also was this other side of it for some people that there was a bit of a, a reclaiming of their time and, and that theme of time is really important and, and appears over and over again. So finally the last one I'm going to read is a poem which I love. Um, this is written by Maya Siegel and it's called Quarantine and I'll just read it and speak for a minute about it. I was ill until proven healthy my mother left me small foods laid on paper plates on the stairs, running away as I came out. A date, some almonds, a sweet potato stabbed through with a fork. I despised her for being so scared of me, for crying to the doctor, if she comes down, I'll feel panicked. I did not come down. I stayed still for six days, four of which I did not get out of bed. My father texted me from downstairs saying he missed me. I heard yelling down below. I heard her slam herself into the bedroom. She started to ration the seltzer water. She texted, this is hard on all of us. She left some Pop Rocks packets on the stairs and texted me that she hoped I would enjoy them. The candy stained my tongue a blue I had never seen before. It was nuclear. No one was there to see. I sat quietly, my tongue showing its colors to the inside of my mouth. What I love so much about this poem is partly it's the reality of the way in which this pandemic and our, our time in close quarters with our family members caused fear between us. And here is a story or here is a, a written account um, in the form of a poem of a mother who's having a lot of trouble managing her fear and her daughter is feeling her mother's fear and anxiety and how ambivalent she is about that and how painful that is for her. Um, and this sort of this wonderful line, which I, I mean, I think she started to ration the seltzer water, you know, there's a kind of absurd quality to it. But then she texted, this is hard on all of us. 
you know, here's this girl who's in quarantine. She's been up in her room for days and days and days. Um, and there's something about that that feels like maybe missing the point. And then, of course, the end, which is so extraordinary. My tongue showing its colors to the inside of my mouth. You know, the idea of this total isolation. And um, that's that's all that she can do is, is sort of um, share this color with herself. So I, I want to um, talk for a couple of minutes about what we learned. And then I want to make sure that there's plenty of time. I hope people have questions and comments and um, that we can have a little bit of a, a dialogue. Um, so I mentioned that we learned that young, so the, the way that we did this, because it was so kind of proof of concept and we sort of threw it together fast, the way that we reached out to young people to contribute was mostly through teachers and students. So lots of teachers sort of assigned this to their kids. And that meant that some kids who were really enthusiastic about writing or who wanted to participate did. And some kids did it out of obligation and you could immediately tell which were which. <laughs> you know, there was no mystery. There were some who just, you know, were being forced to do it. Um, and so one of the things that we needed to think about was, you know, how do you get kids to want to do this? How do you get kids to want to contribute on a sustained basis to a project like this one? And I don't, I can't say that I have um, the perfect answer for that, but it's something that, that it was a question that the project raised and that I, I certainly um, think about a lot. But the other thing that was probably most important is that it was difficult to convey to young people who were coming to this project, typing something and contributing to it. Um, it was difficult to convey this idea of the continuum of writing and to sort of build in a programmatic element whereby they understood that keeping a journal is a practice and that there are different ways that people do it and that it has different um, that, that surviving journals and diaries have different meanings and different values. And you can write about your internal life or you can write about your immediate circumstances or you can chronicle like Yitzhak Rudyshevsky did and describe a collective world far outside of yourself. Or you can toggle between those. Um, and so when we thought about doing a second iteration of the project, what we really wanted to do was to build in a programmatic element so that we could really sort of not teach in a any kind of um, didactic way, but really illuminate what journal writing is all about and what it means and why it matters and why these are these kinds of primary sources are useful um, after they have been kept. And so we convened a small group of kids. We had a cohort of about 15 to 20 students. We worked with them for 12 weeks in the summer last year. And we really broke down what journal writing is, um, the, the sort of paradigm of observing, describing, and reflecting on your life, that it's this kind of, that's sort of the basic practice of it, whether you're writing internally or externally, whatever it is that you're describing, the skill that you need to develop is this ability to observe, to recognize something that is happening that's worthy of being written about to describe it in some kind of meaningful way, and then to reflect on it, to bring in that meaning and to share something about more than just a superficial description, to share the meaning of it. Why is it something worth being written about? And so we had a great experience with these young people. We learned a lot from them. We talked a lot also about social media, about um, the way in which technology is used by young people today, how they think about um, not how they think about things like um, Instagram or Twitter or you know um, Snapchat as being effective or not effective records of their daily lives. Like if that's what washed up on history's shores, you know, 150 years from now, what would we know about young people in the present day? And how does journal writing fit into that? Because in some ways, you can't really say that teens are invisible. Teens are more visible than ever. You know, they're certainly more visible than they were when I was growing up. 
but the modes that they are using to contribute, the way in which young people are talking to one another and contributing to the public conversation tend to be very outward facing and performative. That's sort of the nature of um, social media. And so we talked a lot about that and about, you know, is, is there a place for diary writing or journal writing in the present day? Is there a way to, to create a space for that so that there might be a more substantive kind of um, record of the daily life of young people living today with all the current pressures that they're experiencing and all the downstream effects of policies that they're experiencing, whether it's gun violence or climate, economic, um, you know, stress, immigration, housing, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic, the opioid pandemic, poverty, whatever it might be, you know, how are those, how are they living and experiencing those um, aspects of daily life? And how would they record them and reflect upon them for the now um, for for the sake of posterity. So the next iteration of this project, which is something that I'm sort of somewhat quietly working on with a couple of really smart people, is to try to pull all of this together. It's 30 years since, you know, since I first became interested in this subject. It's 20 years since Salvaged Pages came out. It's an expansion of the idea of the meaning of diary and journal writing among young people and ongoing research to find journals and diaries written by young people throughout history. And then to put that archival material alongside some type of journal writing platform that would allow young people to come and contribute on an ongoing basis with some programmatic element to help them understand what they're doing and why. Um, and, and the vision really is to create um, a massive youth archive of contemporaneous writing that would really change um, the way that we understand the internal lives of young people. Because if there was one thing that I think I got from salvaged pages and from the diaries that I read over the decades and then the experience of the COVID-19 pandemic, and most recently, even journals that are coming out now of Ukraine, um, young people who have been written accounts of their, you know, running across the border, or a young girl who's 16 years old, who some of you may have seen tweeted a series of tweets about the death of her, um, I believe it was her uncle in a bombing. You know, if there's one thing that I've learned, there's a certain perspective that young people have, and it's fleeting. And once it's gone and you become an adult, you, you it's lost forever. And so there was a kind of urgency to ask young people to witness the world as they are living through this period of time, document it the way they see it, share their reflections about it for the benefit um, of all of us. And so that is the, the big vision, which I don't know exactly how it will, um, what form it will take, but it, it is certainly, I think, uh, what is next.